Hello, my name is Brandon, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. In this video, we will do a brief overview about variable transformations. And of course, like, comment, share, and subscribe. So let's get going. So why will we transform variables in the first place? I'll break it down to one statement. We would transform variables to conform to regression assumptions, which in turn amplifies predictive power and increases the overall quality of the model. So in many cases, if not most cases, we're using regression to make predictions. And by transforming some variables, we can increase the power of those predictions. And of course, the overall quality of the model. So a metaphor I like to think of is, it's kind of like a car tune-up. It's a way to make sure everything is working optimally to obtain the best performance and safety. So if my car has a low tire, will it still drive? Absolutely. Will it drive to the best of its ability? Probably not. It may fail in an emergency. It may cause the tire to wear unevenly. It may cause braking problems. A sensor might go off in my car. So it creates issues even though the car will still drive. Transforming variables is kind of like making sure all the tires on the car are pumped up to the right pressure, all the brakes are working, the lights are working, and the car is operating at its optimal performance and safety potential. Transforming variables allows us to tighten up and tune up the regression model so we can make better predictions. There are four primary reasons we might transform variables in our model. Number one, to even out the variance of a variable if the assumption of homoscedasticity is violated. So two of my favorite words are homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity here in statistics. So in this case, homoscedasticity, the prefix of homo means same, hetero means different. So homoscedasticity means sameness in residuals. And that means residuals are independent with a mean of zero. They have even variance across the values of X and they are randomly scattered. And we'll look at that visually here in a second. Number two, to normalize a variable if the assumption of normality is violated. Now we can do this by just visual inspection using a histogram or density plot. We could use probability plots, or we could use numerical normality tests such as Kolmogorov, Smirnoff, and Shapiro Wilkes. However, in most cases, just a visual inspection is fine. Use a histogram or a probability plot to just visually see if the variable is normal. Three, to linearize the regression model if it seems individual variables are non-linear. And four, reduce the impact of outliers and high leverage observations. So you're probably familiar with the idea of outliers. Those are observations that are drastically far away from the mean of the variable. And high leverage, some people aren't familiar with that necessarily, but a high leverage data point is a data point that because it's so far out of the norm, what it does is it actually changes the orientation of like a regression line. It can pull it up or down or side to side in some way because it exerts a lot of leverage, just like a seesaw or something else on the regression line and therefore it distorts the regression line. To recap, there are four reasons. Even out variance, normalize a variable, linearize the regression model, or reduce the impact of outliers and high leverage observations. So what are the primary methods for doing this? In many cases, a simple deterministic, meaning non-random mathematical function, is applied to one or more variables. Often, the transformation is a relatively simple algebraic function that is reversible, it's invertible. So, first common one are power functions. So the most common of which is the square root, which is the same thing as a value raised to the half power. So power functions are very common. Logarithmic functions, the two most common being log base 10 and log base E, which is the natural log. You could use a base of any number or value, but log base 10 and log base C or the natural log are the two most common. Next are the reciprocal function, which is just one divided by that value. Now there are other more complex transformations such as Box-Cox, Yeo-Johnson, which are specific applications of the ones we discussed before. And in this playlist at some point, I plan on going over both of those, at least in general. Sometimes it is appropriate to combine operations. So we'll talk about reflection at a later point in this playlist, scaling or adding or subtracting a constant for specific reasons. Now data that are grouped require special attention. 
In that case, we examine normality with respect to group means, not the individual scores. Now, if scores contain zero and or negative values, additional steps must be taken to eliminate problematic mathematical issues. The most common is the reciprocal function. So that's one divided by X, whatever our variable X might be. If we have the value of zero in our values, then of course that's one divided by zero, which is undefined. So we'll have to do something different there. And of course, negative values can be problematic when we're dealing with logarithms. So in those special cases, we might have to do some other operation on our data to eliminate those mathematical issues. And we will talk about that as we go. So homoscedasticity. Let's take a look at a very basic example. So over here on the left, we just have two variables, their X variable and the Y variable. They are both normally distributed. It's just data I generated. In the middle there, we have the dotted regression line. So it makes a prediction that in this case, because there's not a strong linear relationship, that for any value of X, the value of Y is about 50. So again, this is just toy data that I did for this video, but this is just normal versus normal. Now, if you look at the residual plot of that data, it looks like this. To read this, just to reiterate, let's take this data point over here on the left. On the left graph, we have a value for X of about you know, 12 or 13 on the x-axis, and a value of about 39 on the y-axis. Well, we can see that a regression line predicts a value of about 50. So the prediction error or the residual is about, you know, 11 below what we would predict. So if we move over to the residual plot, we will see that that value also circled has a residual of about negative 11, which makes sense. So that's how we read the actual scatter plot on the left and the residual plot over on the right. Now for homoscedasticity, what we're looking for is a general pattern of scattered data, of scattered residuals. We don't want any curves or different shapes like triangles or anything like that. We want an evenly distributed set of residuals. So if we took all the residuals above zero, all the residuals below zero, and even them out, they would have a mean of zero. So something like this is what we're actually looking for. Now let's examine where that's not the case. So here we have a V-shaped scatter plot. So we can see our X variable and our Y variable. Again, this is just data I created for this example. Now let's look at the residual plot. What do you notice? Well, our residual plot does not look like the last slide. It actually forms a triangular pattern. And what that means is that our predictions are gonna be, quote, better on the lower end of the X variable than on the higher end of the X variable. There is much more variance on the higher end of the X variable than on the lower end of the X variable. So this is going to cause problems. If we are making predictions, the quality of our predictions in terms of variance is not going to be the same across the range of our X variable. And that's something that transformations can help us remedy. We might also have something that looks like this. So this is a curve shape scatter plot. And if we look at the residuals, they're also curved. So in this case, we have some residuals below, some above, and some below again, because of the curved nature of our data. Again, this is something we do not want, and that transformations can help fix for us. So what are some challenges with transformations? First, variables that have been transformed are sometimes harder to interpret. So if the measure is commonly known and understood, such as sales dollars, if we transform it, say like the multiplicative inverse of sales dollars can be harder to interpret and communicate. Now related to that is that making meaningful predictions often means inverting the transformed variable or variables back to original form. So that adds additional steps and complexity. And of course, when you add more steps and complexity, more room to make mistakes. Oftentimes, selecting the best transformation can be a process of trial and error. There is no silver bullet here. So sometimes we have to try a transformation, check its distribution, and then see if it fits normality and our other assumptions. And if it doesn't, we try another one. So it just depends on the nature of the data. And it can take a little bit of time to figure out one, if a transformation is appropriate, and two, if so, which one. Now transformations can sometimes overshoot the goal of transformations and create issues in the other direction. So we must verify and recheck after transforming. So for example, if we have a variable that is heavily right skewed and we perform a transformation, it might be too powerful and now it's left skewed. 
So we've created another problem rather than solving the original one. So we always have to go back and verify and recheck. Now, as I mentioned, group data and values that are zero and or negative require additional steps because of the nature of those variables and those numbers. We can risk unintended consequences in variable relationships. So after transformation, we circle back, do some more EDA, some exploratory data analysis to make sure we haven't created any relationship problems and not just sort of a univariate problem. And of course, because of all of this additional work, the fine tuning of models adds additional time and complexity to the process, which should be taken into account. So once we go in and start transforming variables, we obviously have to go back, make sure that transformation is appropriate and fits the goals of our model. Then we have to go back again, make sure we don't create any other issues that we didn't have before, check our relationships. So we're always circling back to make sure that this transformation process is achieving what we wanted to achieve without creating new problems we have to solve. All right, that wraps up this brief introduction to variable transformations. Again, this is the first video in the playlist, so we'll go into more in depth as we go throughout the playlist. But for now, I hope this got you thinking about how we do data analysis and how you might improve your techniques in data analysis and make really nice, tight, efficient, powerful models, because that's the goal. Thanks again for stopping by and watching this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I will see you again in the next one. Take care and bye-bye.